Hi, Expanded here. What is the animal you fear the most? Spiders, snakes, sharks? What about a swan? I'm not kidding, a swan. But not any kind, a black one. Well, most financial market participants, traders, brokers, bankers, economists, even the politicians fear it. It is rare but devastating, but we are not talking about the animal anymore. So what is this mysterious black swan you're asking? It is a phenomenon which occurs very seldom, a so-called low probability event, and it has more devastating consequences than what the experts can plan for in their crisis scenarios. It tends to be overwhelming because of the unforeseen connections and spillover effects that follow the initial shock. I guess this is the most I can squeeze into a short reflection about the black swan, but if you are interested to learn more, you can do so by reading the book of Nassim Nicholas Taleb, a Lebanese-American statistician dedicated an entire book to coin this term. So the currently circulating illness I was mentioning in my previous vlog is the root cause for the momentary black swan. We have seen it unfold in China less than a month ago. And by the time I am writing my notes for this reflection, it has already caught up with us also in Europe. This reminds me about a movie based on a horror computer game, but more about this in a different video. Despite the currently early stages of the ailment, we already start seeing these spillover effects taking place. People are projecting their prognosis linearly into the future, based on what they heard in the news or what they saw, also comparing the ailment to the Spanish flu from 1918, and so forth. We had to realize that our expectation about our civilization was very high, and now we are revising it as we see neighbors hamstering groceries, panicking markets sliding, company lockdowns are interpreted as invitation for all to go and gather in the parks fire sales all over the world except for China wiped out stock returns of the last five to eight years by now. The European and American indices all started sliding towards the last weeks of February. Since then, anyone who thought they saw the market rebounding and tried to get into cheap had to experience the falling knife cutting their hands. We saw extremely high intraday volatility and a clear downward trend. The institutional investors who started the fire sale had to get rid of assets which had the potential to violate investment mandates, so it is understandable for them to exit the market temporarily. It would be foolish though for us to make any predictions what might happen over the next weeks and months. At this time we can only speculate. However, it makes sense to prepare for two distinct scenarios. If the general narrative turns around, and the fears around the ailment affecting economic growth will subside, then we can expect a rebound. However, if the ailment keeps spreading at an exponential pace, we may see an extended period of lockdowns and sooner than later companies might run into financial problems. The first companies affected are the ones with high operating costs and low margins. Those tend to be the ones with the least reserves covering income shortfalls. We already heard about airlines going bankrupt. The first one catching our attention was Hainan Airline, which needed to be rescued by the Chinese government in mid of February. The next group of businesses has a cash reserve of a few months and might only go under if their operations will be discontinued over several months. I put retail stores, manufacturers of consumer goods, travel agencies and businesses in the offline education sector into this category. Besides that, the very first enterprises that noticed the problem were banks and trading companies, believe you me. They experienced high volatility in the markets even before any government safety measures started to take place. Why are banks and trading companies affected, you are asking? In order to run a sustainable business model, all investment companies set up rules and limits and try to enforce them systematically. So, one such safety precaution is a so-called stop loss. Rules do not allow for a trade to take place without this stop loss limit. 
This should, under normal circumstances, ensure that trades get closed automatically after reaching a preset level of loss, thereby preventing further losses from occurring. And as long as market prices change at a reasonable speed, otherwise said the markets have low volatility, this tool should work as intended. It closes open position when a critical loss limit is reached and thereby leaving the traders with less worries about losses. But what is a stop loss in its essence? Does it provide any guarantees? No, not really. A stop loss merely ensures that a sale gets triggered once the predefined price decline has been reached. Therefore, in markets of slow price changes, it behaves almost like a guarantee. As prices slowly reach the stop loss triggering the sale, market prices would be changing slowly enough for the sale to be still executed closely to the predetermined stop loss level. The trade is closed and no further price decline should harm the trader. But what happens if the prices are moving fast? In other words, volatility is high. Well, very often when prices are moving fast, the specific price level at which the stop loss gets triggered will not be the price at which the stock will keep trading. A stock could fall from a relatively high point uh, well beyond the stop loss limit. When the stop price gets crossed, the sale gets triggered. The position is however no longer able to be closed at the stop loss level which the trader predetermined. The position can only be closed out at the current market price, which is by now well below the stop loss level. So the position gets closed at the price which is currently being traded, leaving the trader with a loss higher than what he was accounting for in his worst scenarios. Therefore, a stop loss should be treated as a trigger rather than a risk mitigation tool. There is another side effect of stop losses in a highly volatile market. As volatility increases, prices usually bounce strongly up and down. Up and down movements tend to be temporary and can suddenly revert. In markets like these, stop losses, if not carefully adjusted, can result to disasters. Just imagine having to close the trade in the red when prices are almost certain to at least temporarily return to previous levels. If stop losses are company policies, in volatile markets this would frequently result in traders having to take their losses. The money really leaves the pockets of the trader, sometimes referred to as capitalizing their losses. Contrary to trades where the stop loss is not set in place and the trader decides on cancelling trades. Which is a dangerous concept if not done by a professional. More often than not, precisely due to the misjudgment of a stop loss, in highly volatile markets losses get accounted for more often than profits. Just think about this for a moment. How often have we seen it in the news? A flooding or hurricane event devastating a nearby settlement. The owner of the ruined property is crying, saying things like, this was an unexpected, unfortunate event. We were preparing for bad weather, but this was not expected to happen. The same way as such news misrepresent facts, calling an obvious occurrence on a coastline an unexpected unfortunate event, so do stop losses get misrepresented as risk mitigation tools, and we shall understand them for what they really are. Trade automation and algorithmic trading by extension without proper application of stop losses can lead to devastating consequences. Unsophisticated algorithms are usually prompted by a trigger similar to a stop loss, and we are yet to see an algorithm which is able to properly take care of volatility changes. With that in mind, I would like to advise you to rethink how we use stop losses for risk mitigation. Also, a note for myself to keep sufficient cash for the coming months. That is all for now. Thank you for tuning in and join us again next time. Bye bye.